Hey, 42 here. When was the last time you took a little something to make yourself feel better? And no, I don't mean a cheeky book's fizz on Christmas morning to take the edge off family time. Almost all of us have taken over-the-counter pain relief for a headache at some point or other. Maybe an antihistamine for those spring sniffles, or an antacid to extinguish the fire in your belly after a gel frazy. We take these things in the belief they'll help us because well, science. A few hundred years ago, if you'd visited your local doctor complaining of a migraine, you might have returned home with a freshly drilled hole in your head, thanks to a medical technique called trepanning. Today, thankfully, you'll likely be told to take a trip to the local pharmacy to pick yourself up some ibuprofen. But while scanning the shelves for your doctor-recommended medicine, tucked away next to the paracetamol and erectile dysfunction treatment. You know, things that actually work, according to my friend, obviously. You'll find a cluster of little bottles labelled with words like natural and remedy. Look even closer and you'll notice another word on these seemingly reputable bottles. Homeopathy. With your ibuprofen in one hand and a homeopathic remedy in the other, you might well assume Eva would do a good job of dispelling that pesky migraine. After all, it's the 21st century, and pharmacies surely only sell treatments that work, right? Actually, not so much. That harmless looking bottle of pills you bought alongside the ibuprofen is more akin to drilling a hole in your head than it is to any modern medicine. Think of homeopathy, and images of sacred herbs, minerals, and essential oils might come to mind. With common side effects including incessant whale songs, incense, and a total absence of rational thought. But this really couldn't be any further from the truth. Well, apart from the bit about whale songs and gullibility. The number one ingredient in homeopathic remedies? Water. So why, you might ask, am I comparing water to someone drilling a hole in your head? To answer this question, I need to take you back to 1796, when homeopathy was invented. Back then, medical care was, for want of a better word, shit. As a result, getting ill was often a death sentence. To be fair, doctors in those days had little prior knowledge to go on and had to make do with a trial and error approach most of the time, with trial basically involving fiddling around a bit with your insides and hoping for the best, and error involving you being dead. An infamous example of just how much physicians of the time got it wrong was the procedure of bloodletting. Bloodletting, if you're not already aware, is the act of draining a patient's blood, either by placing leeches on their skin, or simply by taking a knife and stabbing them a bit. Doctors used bloodletting on George Washington whilst he lay on his deathbed. And yes, I did say deathbed, because shockingly, draining almost four litres of blood had little to no effect on the throat infection that had been bothering him. It did very effectively kill him though. Now, you don't need six years at med school and a stethoscope to figure out that letting someone's blood drain away as if you were emptying a big fleshy bath isn't much of an idea. Bleeding to death, and the high risk of infection aside, the chances of bloodletting actually curing you of your ailment was practically non-existent. So surely doctors only prescribed this lethal procedure as a last resort? Unfortunately not. Bloodletting was all the rage back then, representing the go-to treatment for pretty much anything. It was the 18th to 19th century version of putting a wet blue paper towel on it at school, which, as far as I can remember, actually did cure everything. Pneumonia? Bloodletting. Smallpox? Bloodletting. Acne? Bloodletting. Nosebleed? Bloodletting for you. And if by some miracle, bloodletting didn't cure you, or kill you, of course, there were plenty of other cutting edge treatments out there for you to try. These included forced vomiting, induced sweating, and yes, you've guessed it, drilling a hole in your head. Samuel Hahnemann, 
a German physician at the time, was, quite understandably, dissatisfied with the state of his profession. Feeling the medical treatments he had been taught sometimes did the patient more harm than good. Something I'm inclined to agree with him about, though that is admittedly the only overlap in our worldview Venn diagrams. Hahnemann believed in a doctrine called Similia Similibus Corenta, or like cures like. The basic principle was this. Taking something which causes the same symptoms you're trying to treat will cure you of your ailment. This all sounds very well and good, albeit devoid of any actual scientific reasoning, until you realise most illnesses cause pretty horrible symptoms, which in turn leads to some, shall we say, eyebrow-raising homeopathic elixirs. For example, for someone suffering from burning, watery eyes and a runny nose due to hay fever, your homeopathic prescription would be made from onion. Because as anyone who's ever suffered the wrath of an onion whilst preparing dinner will tell you, that shit's potent. It's hard to believe rubbing raw onion in your eyes would cure you of hay fever, though I can see it might take your mind off it for a bit whilst you focus on the inevitable excruciating pain. But suffering is kind of part of the homeopathic deal. The word homeopathy actually comes from the Greek omios, meaning similar, and pathos, meaning suffering. Before you go rubbing raw onion in your eyes the next time the pollen count is high, even Hahnemann started to realise his treatments were causing unpleasant reactions, sometimes even dangerous ones. Yeah, no shit. Examples include ingesting a potentially lethal, vomit-inducing poison as a treatment for seasickness. That one didn't go down too well, quite literally. Begrudgingly, Hahnemann instructed that his preparations be given at the lowest possible dose, which helped to reduce unwanted side effects. In simple terms, he transformed his concoctions from being dangerous and useless to just plain useless. But Hahnemann didn't see it that way. In Like Cures Like, he'd found himself a catchy tagline. And by God, he was going to make it work. It just so happened that around this time, he had a magical epiphany. Amazingly and conveniently, he discovered that the more his active ingredients were diluted in either alcohol or water, the better the patient responded to them. Yeah, that must have been it. Nothing to do with the fact that doing nothing turned out to be a much better treatment than doing harm. Surprisingly, rashes clear up on their own when you're not smothering them in extract of poison ivy. That's a real homeopathic treatment, by the way. Hahnemann took this heavily flawed logic and ran with it, pushing the limits of dilution to the extreme, safe in the knowledge that the weaker he made his remedies, the more potent they became. The fruit of all this watered down labour was the creation of something called the centesimal scale, or as it's more commonly referred to, the C scale. Let's start with the strongest, which in Hahnemann's topsy-turvy land naturally means the weakest strength on the C scale, 1C. To make this dilution, your friendly neighbourhood homeopath simply takes one drop of his active ingredient and mixes it with 100 drops of water. Any rational person can see that diluting a substance in this way could only serve to make it weaker. But Hahnemann had a trick up his sleeve. Succussion. It may sound like a Neanderthal attempting to pronounce succession, but it was actually just a fancy word for vigorously shaking your newly diluted substance, either by hitting the bottle repeatedly against the palm of your hand, or bashing it on a leather-bound book. Yes, that actually was one of the rules. Hahnemann believed this process of diluting and succussing, shaking to you and me, a mixture, resulted in the release of a spirit-like power within the medicine. Because, according to him, water 
has memory. Coincidentally, that's a belief shared by Olaf from Frozen. This liquid would then be sprayed onto little white round sugar pills to make for easier consumption. Let's take things up, or should that be down a notch, by moving on to the next number on the C scale, 2C. To make a 2C dilution, all you have to do is take a single drop from your newly succussed bottle of 1C solution and add that to 100 drops of water. Oh, and bash it against a book, obviously. You can't expect it to cure you if you don't bash it against a book. Now, the original active ingredient has been watered down to one part in 10,000. Want 3C? Sure, just take a drop from the 2C bottle and add it to another 100 drops of water, being careful to give it a good book bashing when you're done or your efforts will be f***ing useless. You've now diluted it to one part in one million. I think we're getting the hang of this, so let's get a little frisky and fast forward to 6C. At this strength, your active ingredient makes up one part in a trillion of your solution. That's the equivalent of one drop in 20 swimming pools. At 12C, it's reduced to one part in a septillion. That's the same as one drop in the Atlantic Ocean. Repeat this long-winded and undeniably ridiculous process 30 times, and you'll end up at Hanneman's recommended strength, 30C. That's one part in a Novum Decillion. For those of you who've never heard of that number before, that's a one with 60 zeros after it. To put that into perspective, it's about how many atoms there are in the sun. Put one drop of your active ingredient in all of the oceans on Earth, and your solution would be far, far more concentrated than a 30C homeopathic dilution. In fact, you would need to give 2 billion doses per second to 6 billion people for 4 billion years to deliver a single molecule of the original material to a single patient. Put simply, at that strength, there is no active ingredient. Your fancy homeopathic solution is just water, nothing else. But according to Hahnemann, that makes it more potent than ever. Homeopaths don't even bother arguing that there's any remaining active ingredient left in their treatments. Even they admit their solutions are just water. It's about the memory of the water, remember. But if we humour that somewhat iffy hypothesis for just a second, it raises rather a lot of questions. If water really does have memory, then surely every time I help myself to a cold, refreshing glass of high quality haste to o my body is being bombarded by every single thing that water has come into contact with. Millions of animals, humans, rivers, lakes, muddy puddles, sewers, toilets, Donald Trump's chest hair, and the bedsheets of the Ritz Carlton Hotel. Scientists have even theorised that every time you drink a glass of water, there are pretty good odds at least one molecule has passed through the bladder of Oliver Cromwell. Homeopathy then, to the modern ear, sounds like a load of heavily, heavily diluted shit. Which, I regret to inform you, is also a genuine homeopathic remedy. But in the 18th century, it was either that or grab the leeches, and without the scientific knowledge we have now, who can really blame them? I'd rather drink a nice glass of water than have someone drill a hole in my head any day of the week. This was a time when scientists believed there were tiny little people living inside your sperm, and that making a baby essentially involved unleashing an army of minuscule manned submarines on a mission to hunt down the egg. We've moved on since then, thankfully, because that is deeply disturbing. And modern medicine now relies on a little thing called evidence. So surely homeopathy has fallen by the wayside. 
no longer required in our enlightened age. Unfortunately not. According to the Homeopathic Research Institute, so take this with a dilution of salt, over 200 million people worldwide use homeopathy on a regular basis. That's more than the population of Russia. Many celebrities swear by homeopathic remedies, including David Beckham, Cindy Crawford, Usain Bolt, and Emma Watson, to name but a few. The British royal family are also massive fans of this magical water. Queen Elizabeth II is said to never travel anywhere without her first aid homeopathic remedy kit. With all these impressive endorsements, it's not surprising to hear the global market value for homeopathy in 2017 was approximately 5.39 billion US dollars. So what's happening? Surely these people should know better. Yeah, maybe not Bex, but the rest of them. Or do they know something we don't? Does homeopathy actually work? And all this time we could have been experiencing its healing powers ourselves? No. Definitely, absolutely, 100% no. Numerous studies and double-blind tests have investigated homeopathy's healing properties, and pretty much all of them have come to the same conclusion. Homeopathy is nothing more than a placebo. If you want to learn the ins and outs of the placebo effect, you can check out my video on the subject. I'll add a link in the description. But in a nutshell, it's your mind playing tricks on you. Now, those tricks can, in themselves, be pretty powerful. But that doesn't change the fact that they're nothing more than mind-based smoke and mirrors. Which is why several prominent international bodies, the British Medical Association amongst them, have recommended the withdrawal of government funding for homeopathy. And yes, I did say government funding. It turns out Australia, the United Kingdom, Switzerland, France, and no doubt many more countries have been dipping into the public purse to fund these diluted water pellets. In 2016, it was estimated the NHS, that's Britain's National Health Service, spent an eye-watering £5 million on homeopathic treatments. After countless campaigns to have homeopathy removed from its list of treatments, in 2017, the NHS formally requested that homeopathic remedies be added to the blacklist of forbidden prescription items. Which sounds like a textbook for a defense against the dark arts class at Hogwarts. And, like the dark arts, it also makes homeopathy sound kind of dangerous, doesn't it? But surely, a placebo effect can't be doing any harm, can it? Well, it turns out that homeopathy might be doing more harm than good, after all. In 2019, the FDA released a statement saying that homeopathic products have the potential to cause significant and even permanent harm. But hang on there a second, 42. You've just spent this whole video trying to tell me there's nothing to these pills. Now you're expecting me to believe they're dangerous? Well, yes, but let me explain. Homeopathic remedies are made from literally anything, from plants as innocent as a daisy to the highly toxic belladonna. Animal and human bodily fluids make the cut, most of the time diseased, as do minerals from salt to mercury, and a host of deadly bacteria. If the dilution process is done correctly, there shouldn't be a single molecule of these substances present in the final remedy. But when mixed incorrectly, the effects can be devastating. Take a look at this bottle of Highlands Teething Tablets. It seems innocent enough, I'm sure you'll agree. It claims to be 100% natural and to have no side effects. If you had a screaming baby at home chewing on everything in sight, these might seem like a safe option to help soothe your child's teething pains. Plenty of people agreed. In 2004, it was the second most popular teething product in the US. So why then, in 2010, did the FDA raise concerns over these little harmless pills? 
Oh, just because laboratory results showed they contained inconsistent and sometimes excessive amounts of belladonna. What's belladonna? Only one of the most toxic plants we've ever discovered. Also known as deadly nightshade belladonna, it's so poisonous that eating just a small quantity of its leaves or berries can kill you. And touching its leaves can leave you with a serious rash. Give some to a baby and teething would be the least of their worries. The FDA claims it received 400 reports of adverse reactions to Highlands teething tablets, with the most prevalent side effect being seizures. It's also estimated that 10 children lost their lives due to this unregulated homeopathic medicine. So did Highlands stop selling it? Well, yes and no. They eventually discontinued the belladonna containing formula after a lengthy tug of war with the FDA, with a spokeswoman for Highlands insisting the teething formula was safe and that they are a top selling product and a consumer favorite. They also expressed regret that 24 staff members lost their jobs as a result of the product's withdrawal. I see their ethics have been diluted too. 6C at least. Today, they sell a belladonna-free oral pain relief homeopathic remedy. Its active ingredient? Arnica montana, also called wolfsbane, a herb known for causing severe gastroenteritis, internal bleeding of the digestive tract, and death. Brilliant! But seriously, how can this happen? Aren't there meant to be health and safety standards for the products we consume? You'd think so, but in the US under current policy, the FDA does not evaluate homeopathic treatments for safety or effectiveness. And in the UK, there's no legal regulation of homeopathic practitioners whatsoever. You don't need any qualifications or any experience, which means I could literally start diluting any bloody substances in water and sell them as miracle cures for a pretty penny all whilst calling myself a certified homeopath, and it would be completely legal. Roll up, roll up, come get your moustache water. Strength, 42C. But you're not just putting your life on the line with what you do take when you opt for a homeopathic remedy. It's what you don't take that might cause you the most harm. Whether it's juice cleanse fanatics, mystical healers, or Gwyneth Paltrow and her magical goop stickers, when it comes to health, everyone has an opinion on what you should and shouldn't do. And most of the time, indulging in a bit of alternative medicine won't do you any harm. It probably won't do you any good either, but that's okay. But when you hear stories of how Pam next door beat breast cancer by carrying a crystal in her bra every day, that's when things start to go a bit wrong. Because sure, she may have genuinely carried a coloured rock in her underwear for a year, but when she gets the all clear from the doctor, it won't be the gruelling chemo that gets the credit. No, it was the magical crystal nestled in her tits that did it. And it's stories like this that cause an undercurrent of suspicion regarding modern medicine. Why follow through with a treatment full of chemicals and side effects when you can enlist the power of Mother Earth and cure yourself naturally? This, unfortunately, was the tragic basis of the tale of seven-year-old Francesco from the Italian town of Cagli. When diagnosed with a common ear infection, Francesco's parents decided against giving their son antibiotics, as his doctors recommended. Instead, they consulted their local homeopath, who prescribed a homeopathic remedy which was to magically cure him thanks to the infallible memory of water. Three days later, Francesco was dead. The young boy had fallen into a coma after the infection in his ear spread to his brain and he died of encephalitis. Had he been taken to a hospital and been given modern medicines, he might still be alive today. So the next time you're choosing between that packet of ibuprofen and some magical sugar pills, just remember you're choosing between science and pseudoscience, the future and the past, evidence and faith, and perhaps even life and death.
Thanks for watching. What's that I hear you say? You want to experience my new book, stick a flag in it, but you can't be asked to read? I hear you. That's why you can now get the audiobook release of Stick a Flag in It over on Audible. You'll find the link in the description below. Thank you.